Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well. Glad you joined the class today. Uh, let's pray and uh, we will get into today's uh, lesson. Would like to request any one of us to please lead in prayer. Kitavya, would you would you be able to lead us, please? Sure, sure, Pastor. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time that you've given us, Father. Uh, one, uh, once again, Lord, this week, Lord, to uh, learn, uh, Father, on prayer and intercession, Father. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I pray, Father, that at uh, this time, may you reveal, uh, Father, what's on your heart, Father, to us, so that we may know, Father, how to uh, really, uh, Father, uh, use those principles, Father Lord, uh, to really pray in a manner that is according to your will, Father Lord, that uh, that is aligned to your heart, Father Lord. Uh, thank you and praise you, Father, for uh, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Father, for all the resources, Lord, the course material and all the provisions, Father, the technology and all the, um, Father, provision that you have made for us. I pray, Lord, let your presence abound throughout the session. I pray, Father, that uh, let there not be any uh, technical difficulties or obstacles, Father. I pray for all those who are attending and all those who are planning to attend, Father, Lord, later on. I pray, Father, that you continue to speak to our hearts, Father, and give us the readiness and willingness to obey you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Vivya. Uh, so in the last class, we talked about small group prayers and uh, praying with other believers and the power of agreement. Uh, we said that in the book of Acts, we find that this manner of praying together, it was common practice and uh, the results were tremendous. So there is a, there is a huge place for praying together. And today we will talk about uh, prayer in the life of the local church community. So in order for us to do this, we will uh, look at some uh, passages uh, in, in the Old Testament and how you know God has promised that we are going to see uh, the arising of, of you know, the, the prayer movement among us. Uh, and also we will look at some of these movements in church history thereby uh, that gives us a better understanding of what god is actually talking about so prayer in the local church community must be something that is given priority and uh, uh, when the church community begins to seek god through prayer you know, we understand that you know, that relationship with god is established uh, and also it will it will bring about a certain maturity okay uh, in the community itself now scriptures encourage us or they show us like when we look at god's instructions in the old testament uh, that uh, that uh, kind of puts light on what god meant for prayer to be one particular uh, passage is from leviticus 6 and verse 13 where god had commanded for the fire to remain on the altar so this is in the in the uh, setup right of, of the tabernacle god told that there must always be fire on the altar okay? so in other words if you compare this with the manner in which worship and intercession is going on in the presence of God, uh, or when I say intercession is going on, we know that our intercession you know, goes up to heaven. We've already seen that. It is like incense in the presence of God. So God wants that to be there perpetually or continuously. Okay? Uh, so the fire on the altar, in other words, you know, our prayer, our worship, and our intercession should be continuous in uh, God's presence. So we must never stop providing, you know, the, the sacrifice on the altar because for fire to remain on the altar, what is, what is one of the uh, 
ways in which God would send the fire in the Old Testament, so usually when there is a sacrifice, uh, an acceptable sacrifice, that's when God's fire would come and consume it, isn't it? So in the same way, when our sacrifices are to the Lord, which would be through our praise, through our life, right, through our prayers, when our sacrifices are laid before the Lord, His fire will be provided continuously or His presence will also be given to us. So we must ensure as a church community and as a community of God's people, not just a, a local church, but the larger unit, uh, of God's people in a city uh, or even you know in a region that we have place for intercession and prayer and even uh, in a continual manner so that we can see all that God has promised and we can experience all that God is uh, pouring out on us. Now, let me look back a little, little more uh, in the Old Testament. You know, there is the... Um, Tabernacle of David, which is spoken about uh, when the natural tabernacle was set up, God commanded that the fire should not go out on the altar. Okay, So that is one thing. Now, it just in line with that, it is as if David understood the spiritual meaning of what God had uh, done in the natural tabernacle. So we see that David set up uh, a tabernacle uh, later on. For, for God and in the tabernacle you know, he instituted a certain kind of worship okay now uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this tabernacle of David but I will introduce it here to us and throughout our course even as we go forward with other courses you would have uh, this spoken about you know, to glean insights relevant to the courses uh, you know that you are going to study later on so let me just introduce this Tabernacle of David. Tabernacle of David was a place where, you know, it, it was, it's called the Tabernacle because it's a tent. So he set up a tent in his city. And in this tent, you know, David brought the Ark of the Covenant uh, and he asked for worshippers. Okay, what, who are these worshippers? There are singers, there were musicians, okay, who were specially allocated the responsibility to seek God uh, continually in that tent. So he told them, okay, he assigned them to be there. And we study that this kind of a, uh, a ministry to God okay, went on for about 33 years okay, in that tabernacle. So David set it up. So what is the speciality of this tabernacle that he set up? So he wanted people to minister to God day and night. So 1 Chronicles 15 uh, verses 1 through 17, you know, we, we read about this form of worship and then, you know, again, verse 27, we read about it where what David instituted was such that people would sing to the Lord, people would engage in intercession and prayer 24 by 7. Okay, so uh, that was one of the reasons why he also had a large number of people appointed for ministry in that particular tent. So they would take turns. So there are there are many other passages that talk about this order of worship that he established. Uh, I, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but something like 288 uh, singers. He had instrumentalists. Uh, he also had gatekeepers or people who would control the the order uh, in that uh, place of worship and they would take turns right so you would have batches of uh, worship leaders come in and worship the lord batches of intercessors so they will take turns and this kind of a prayer worship pattern went on for about 33 years and what is the speciality of david's tabernacle you know, it was very impressive to god because it was a form of extravagant worship that David poured out on God. You know, before the tabernacle of David, we do see uh, uh, people ministering unto the Lord, but not in such a continuous way. And the way he had uh, planned the whole thing, you know, he made sure that he had the best singers, he had the best vocal, you know, instrumentalists, he had uh, the best people to take care of God's worship. So all of this really touched God's heart. 
okay uh, and also it was an orderly worship unless he had uh, planned it out well you know the batches of of worshipers could not keep carrying on for 33 years so it was extravagant it was orderly uh, and it was it was a worship which was very close to god's heart and it went on day and night uh, and god was really blessed with it god was really pleased with it okay this form of worship was something that david started or he initiated it but later on we do see that there were other kings who adopted the same form of worship so you had solomon okay, who instructed the people to conduct worship in accordance to the davidic pattern or the davidic order of worship we call it so he uh, also uh, followed the same pattern similarly you had certain other rulers like jehoshaphat who also said okay we will follow this whole worshiping god and you know praising god and interceding to god and uh, jehoshaphat we know that you know he experienced a mighty victory against his enemies when they went forward in worship you had things like joash established the davidic order of worship hezekiah josiah uh, ezra and what really happened when they followed the same pattern as david you know day and night prayer day and night worship what happened we read that these rulers or kings they experienced some tremendous breakthroughs you know they experienced spiritual breakthroughs they experienced deliverance you know, they experienced military victory so there was a lot of positive impact that came out of seeking god in this continuous fashion okay now i've already shared with us that you know one thing is the results of this form of worship but the other thing is how it touched god's heart so god um you know bless the people and god wanted this kind of worship to keep continuing on okay so there is a reference you know we see this in acts chapter 15 when james the then leader or the overseer of the church stood up and spoke in the matter of um, solving uh, the issue uh, about you know gen whether gentiles have to follow jewish traditions or not so when the the council the leader the leaders of the church you know they were discussing okay what kind of rules to apply to the gentiles would the uh, traditions of the jews uh, need to be followed by the gentiles to keep their salvation so in those matters when they were discussing you know james spoke up for the gentiles okay and one of the ways in which he spoke for the gentiles is by reminding the leaders that look this pattern of the gentiles following god you know it's nothing new in fact we had amos a prophet who had prophesied that when the tabernacle of david will be rebuilt you know god is going to even draw gentiles to himself so basically james quotes from the prophecy of amos this is from uh, amos chapter 9 you know where amos uh, talks about the uh, tabernacle of david so i'll just tell you what james says so that's 15 it is in our, in our notes i'm going through our notes only so page 86 uh, the top of page 80, 86 acts 15 verses 13 to 18 is given for us um, uh, verse 16 it says after this i will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of david which has fallen down i will rebuild its ruins and i will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the lord even all the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does all these things so the highlight i've just highlighted two verses in this passage here you see that james is reminding the leaders the gentiles are going to come even all the gentiles who are called by my name says the lord who does all these things so god is going to bring back the gentiles but before he brings the gentiles you know what is it that god also promised through the prophecy of amos he said i will rebuild rebuild what the tabernacle of david 
So what is the tabernacle of David? Is it is God going to have tents all over the world where, uh, you know, similar to bringing in the Ark of the Covenant and appointing uh, musicians and all that? Is it going to replicate the structure that David once built? Is that what God means? In a spiritual sense, you know, we see that Amos was prophesying and saying this form of seeking God through worship, through prayer and intercession, God is going to rebuild that. Okay? And we know that you know, whenever, uh, wherever we see God's promises, the fulfillment of these promises tends to take place normally in the spiritual Zion, which is the church. And you know, later on, you know, we would see that certain promises are fulfilled more literally uh, among Israel or you know, the, uh, the nation of Israel, the people of God. So God is talking about the spiritual fulfillment of this nature or the order or the type of worship that David instituted. Uh, God was so impressed by it that he did not want that to be gone. Okay, so he wanted to bring it back. So he's saying, I want to bring back or in other words, rebuild this form of extravagant, orderly worship as well as prayer and intercession. Okay, and as a result, when I rebuild this form of spiritual worship, prayer and intercession, and another thing to note is it was continuous in line with what we saw God speak in Leviticus uh, chapter 16, verse 3, where God said, you know, there should be fire on the altar continuously. So continuously when there is prayer, continuously when there is worship, you know, God talks about the results of that. And one of the results is that, uh, sorry, at Leviticus 6, verse 13. Yeah, I said verse 3. Uh, so I correct myself, Leviticus 6, verse 13. So as a result of uh, setting up the spiritual worship and the spiritual uh, prayer and intercession, we will see that there will be a harvest. Okay, So when you're talking about mankind may seek the Lord, Gentiles will come. What is it referring to? It is referring to people being saved. Okay, It is referring to many coming into the kingdom of God. So there is going to be an effect on the harvest in these, if you want to call it, you know, the, the last days, the end times, where God is going to draw people to himself. One of the ways in which he will do it is through the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. Extravagant, orderly, continuous worship as well as prayer and intercession. Okay, so that is the promise which we have from the prophet Amos, and James spoke about that in his speech. So you know, God is all uh, passionate, and He is getting ready to rebuild the tab tabernacle of David. Let me uh, ask one of us to read you know, what uh, prophet Amos spoke. This is in Amos chapter 9 verses 11 through 13. Could somebody please uh, read that passage for us? Amos 9 11 through 13. Amos chapter 9 11 through 13. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repaired its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the tre treader of grapes, him who sows seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. So you see here, basically God is saying that uh, what had stopped after 
you know, David's rule and reign, it shall be raised up again. I will raise up the tabernacle of David, okay, which has fallen down and repair its damages. So he will ensure in the spiritual that this form of worship is restored. Okay, and then once it is restored, it says they may possess the remnant of Edom. Now, Edom is also uh, a type of the people who are away from God. So those people will, will come to God. It says all the Gentiles who are called by my name. Again, Gentiles referring to those who uh, are not of God, but who will turn to God. And God is saying that he is going to bring these people back to himself. And just to reiterate what he just said, verse 13, he says, Flowmen shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountain shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. So flowmen shall overtake the reaper is kind of a reference to say that uh, there will be so much of harvest. You know, there will be like plenty of harvest. It's it's not going to be like, you know, season to season, like the plowman uh, will finish his job and then the reaping will be done and the reaping will be complete and then the plowman will come and put the seed. So it won't be like that, but it's almost like the seasons will kind of crisscross overlap because there is so much of harvest that one is not able to gather it all up, you know, in one season. So in that way, there is going to be a mighty uh, uh, coming in of the souls into the kingdom of God. But what is the requirement for that? The raising up of the tabernacle of David. So it's like us engaging in that 24 bar 7 praise, worship, prayer, intercession. So we will talk a lot more about 24 bar 7 praise and worship, um, you know, in, in other places. But since this course is more about um, prayer and intercession, you know, I'm trying to focus more on prayer and intercession. Uh, but please know that, you know, praise and worship is also a huge part of this form of worship. Okay. Uh, so what can we expect? you know, out of what we have learned just now, we can expect that God is raising up uh, people around the world, people, uh, churches, ministries, you know, teams who are engaging in this form of continuous intercession or continuous uh, praise and worship. Uh, and some of us, we probably are part of those ministries some of us we have seen such ministries but as the days go by we are only going to see god raising up rebuilding the tabernacle of david in a spiritual sense among us and we must let that happen okay so that is what we take with us and also you know when we are engaging in this form of uh, prayer and intercession we can expect our ministries to be fruitful in that you know, people will turn to God uh, in, a, in a more, if I may use the term, easier way. Of course, we preach the gospel and we do our part of, you know, um, uh, bring, uh, doing our part, you know, as, as a minister to bring people into the kingdom. But when we are engaging with God and ministering to God, you know, there is an acceleration or, or there is a, a speedening up of bringing souls into the kingdom of God. So there are results, there are spiritual results for engaging in 24 bar 7 prayer and intercession. Okay, So that is what we take away from what we are learning about the tabernacle of David. Now just looking back into history, there are uh, certain movements of prayer uh, that have yielded powerful results and ha it has impacted you know, the uh, communities of people who lived during that time. So we will study about them you know, for us to uh, be inspired that as a generation you know, of God that is living today uh, and, you know, as a generation that would desire the rebuilding of this form of uh, prayer and intercession, you know, what are the things that we can expect? To happen around us. So one example here in our notes is uh, in 480, it talks about a person called Alexander Akimetes and his followers were known as sleepless ones. 
So this person, Alexander, he was a monk himself and he gathered about 300 to 400 monks and he went by a scripture uh, in the New Testament. First Thessalonians 5 verse 17, it says, pray without ceasing. Okay, And he wanted to live that scripture. So what did he do? He gathered these people at a you know given place uh, and over there, uh, they would pray, 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 like continuously. So he caused, you know, he, he encouraged people to practice this form of continuous prayer and intercession. Uh, and they were the first ones you know, to be known as um, uh, people who engaged in 24 bar 7 prayer. You know, maybe you know, there were others as well, but we have the record of Alexander Akimedes. And also, uh, they engaged in prayer to such an extent that they came to be known as the sleepless ones because they were praying even in the night. Okay, So that is the uh, uh, example of Alexander Akimitas. And it inspires us in knowing that you know, he actually thought that he could live out that passage uh, which says, pray without ceasing. And he did it. Okay. So uh, that is Alexander Akimatis. Then we have a record of the Moravians, and I'm sure you know you have heard about it, and you will uh, continue to um, uh, hear about the Moravians quite repeatedly in in a couple of other courses as well. So the Moravians, what is what what do we see uh, in their community? So the Moravian community in Hernhut, it was um, uh, a community which. Uh, uh, an influential man, okay, his name was Count Zinzendorf. He had a space, okay, in, in Moravia. Uh, okay, uh, I won't go into the details of it. So he had a place, and uh, the simplest explanation is that there were refugees from a certain place who did not, who could not, uh, uh, you know, find shelter. So this noble man, Zinzendorf, he said, okay, you come to my uh, herd hut space you you all can stay there and you will have a refuge so basically he was housing refugees yeah at that time this was in 1727 and when he was housing refugees it so happened that there were people from different um, backgrounds who came to find shelter there but he began to notice that they did not have peace among themselves you know, there was always some or the other issue argument uh, and he didn't like that he being a good man and a godly person, he wanted peace in the community. So what he did is he introduced uh, uh, chapel services. He introduced some form of, you know, uh, worship of God in that community. And they uh, had planned that, okay, every, uh, you know, every two weeks or something, some such schedule they had, everyone gather, we will spend time uh, in, in God's word, in prayer and all that. So in that way, then they were regularly gathering and he was really trying to address this issue of uh, disunity among the people. Uh, one particular service, God's presence was very special among them and apparently it was a service where they broke bread and they had communion and all. So when he realized that there was something special about the servant, he did not want to let it go. And he really wanted to follow God in what God was impressing on his heart. So he felt, okay, why not uh, uh, we start prayer from today onwards, from that service onwards. And he just had, he just gave an invitation to the community members and said, I felt like, you know, God did something special in the service. Let's continue in his presence by prayer and intercession. So he said, how many of you can sign up for prayer? I want 24 men and 24 women to sign up. So 24 men and 24 women gave their uh, commitment. And then something called as the chain prayer, it started. You know how uh, for one, one hour, 24, why 24? Because 24 hours in a day. So he wanted somebody to come into every hour of prayer. So the chain prayer started in that service after or rather after that service. Okay. Around the clock. So prayer was happening. But the beautiful thing about this Moravian, uh, some people, like people also call it uh, Moravian revival, 
the train prayer did not stop for a hundred years can you believe it because people were signing up and signing up and signing up and signing up and signing up for a hundred years okay so that is the story about the moravian revival so god's spirit worked in such a way in the hearts of the people that the moravian revival uh, you know uh, it, it was a hundred year long prayer meeting okay and what can you expect when people are praying for a hundred years you know person after person person after person and imagine they did not even have our technology today we schedule we have we use google this that but they just in their own normal simple way they were scheduling one another and praying but the result of the moravian prayer movement some like to call it prayer movement revival whatever what is the result apparently the missionary zeal among the people of the hernhead community was so uh, incredible that you couldn't compare it with you know uh, anywhere else and a missionary movement started out of this prayer movement so what began happening you know you saw that people were signing up for missions to what extent you know you read that there were people who were even willing to sell themselves to slavery to go to a particular particular uh, country or you know to to be a part of a, a certain region so that they could share the gospel okay so that was the missionary zeal to fulfill the great commission that started to emerge among people of the hernhut community and uh, you know when you study uh, all the missionary zeal and all that apparently you know till that time the ratio of missionaries to a given population was 1 is to 5000 so every 5000 population had one missionary going and reaching out to them but later on you know uh, uh, people write that in the regions where these is uh, these missionaries went the ratio came up to 1 is to 60 meaning for every 60 people there was a missionary so so many missionaries started going out and in fact uh, by 1776 226 missionaries had been sent out from the very community itself the hernhut community so something marvelous god was doing out of the community and you know in the region because of this prayer movement and you know as you read accounts of others there are people like john wesley who talk about uh, the impact that the moravians and their you know missionary mindset had on him so it had an impact on john wesley um, and uh, even you know somebody like uh, william carey William Carey is we call him the father of modern missions, and he, you know, he came to India, and there is so much that you read about William Carey, the impact that he made. He was influenced by the teachings of the Moravians as well. So, you know, we see that there was a genuine um, move, a missionary zeal that God birthed out of the Moravian prayer movement. It's just to encourage us. that you know when god that's what god said right he said that when i rebuild raise up the tabernacle of david then what will happen you know the the uh, gentiles will come the the remnant of edom and then we saw how uh, there's going to be this tremendous harvest that there will be the harvest you you won't finish the season of gathering the harvest that the sower will still have to continue his work because the harvest is plentiful but all that is a result of the let the fire be on the altar continuously or praise worship we have certain ministries you know that do engage in praise and worship uh, and, and many of you will be aware of of such uh, ministries in your own cities but also you know prayer and intercession continuous prayer and intercession and we see the results here moravian saw an incredible incredible impact of the prayer movement now the next example here in our notes is that of uh, the prayer mountain in seoul korea uh, this was initiated by the ministry of uh, pastor david yongicho uh, who uh, leads the yoido full gospel assembly and uh, what basically happened is 
they designated a mountain as a place where people could go to spend extended hours in prayer and intercession. Okay, so once this was um, selected and you know, kind of um, set aside, it started attracting visitors from the city and outside the city. So people would go there, they would spend time in retreats, uh, they, they have provided some prayer cells and rooms for prayer. So apparently, you know, over a million visitors, it is recorded that even over a million visitors have, have come there in a given year to do what? To pray, to uh, worship. To see so I mean there's not too much written here in our notes but you know you could kind of just look it up and it's quite incredible apparently when people pray on that mountain those who are going by right close by they can hear the screams the wails the worship uh, you know the the uh, so basically like even the noises or the sound of the mountain can be heard around because there are those many people praying on that mountain and uh, also you know when you read the testimonies that uh, dr cho gives he says a lot of what has happened in his ministry is because of giving to uh, spending time in prayer you know spending time in intercession okay uh, and he talks about how engaging in this form of uh, not just prayer as in uh, praying for others but also spiritual warfare Engaging in things like this has made a difference in the spiritual atmosphere of the city and the nation of uh, South Korea. And I uh, you know he talks about how people have come to know, in a come to know Jesus, accepted Jesus in a speedy way, in an accelerated way. Uh, and and he attributes that to the prayer movements that they have as part of the church and as part of the ministry. You know, over here. A prayer mountain is, is something that we talk about. I don't know if I mentioned to you earlier, uh, you know, Dr. Cho, uh, he also shares how at 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, they have this practice of a church gathering for prayer and intercession. So you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, many churches that can do that, maybe for practical reasons, you know, we're not able to gather, but apparently, you know, his church would do that. And uh, he also shares some jokes about once, uh, you know, he slept, and he, uh, he slept through, uh, you know, like uh, like around four-ish, he was still asleep. And uh, his mother-in-law called up and said, like, son, where are you? And uh, come quickly, the meeting is starting. So the reason he had to go to the meeting is because he's the pastor, right? And he has to lead the meeting. So he just uh, jumped out of the bed and he was uh, so tense that, you know, oh, no, I slept slept through this time and he ran and he started leading the uh, prayer time to realize that he was in his pajamas okay he forgot to change so you know he shares all these funny stories but the thing is he talks about how that was a daily thing that was a commitment for that church so the point i'm trying to make is the investment that they made in prayer and you know the results that the uh, the as a ministry, they share the results that they have seen. A lot of people have, uh, the God's work has been done uh, very powerfully uh, across that city and that country. So that's the bottom line. Okay, It's not to praise any ministry or anything. You know, there's, we have to be discerning. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we cannot um, disregard the outcome of uh, prayer, the outcome of uh, engaging in the right things in the ministry. So, you know, we take that lesson with us. When we engage in prayer, prayer movements, they will yield the result because God has promised, right? He said, if you rebuild the tabernacle, then I will, you know, uh, cause this to happen. There will be a mighty harvest. The Gentiles will come. So, through this prayer mountain, you know, they uh, share that they have seen God do that and okay there is the other account here about uh, the international house of prayer this is in kansas city and a lot of us are quite well aware of the ihop okay it's also known as ihop okay of kansas city um where prayer and worship 
goes on 24 by 7 uh, and they have tried to follow the pattern the davidic order the tabernacle of david you know that form of worship because what is the speciality of that worship day and night day and night prayer so they have instituted that and apparently it began on the 19th of september 1999 and uh, we know that till today the the prayer continues the worship continues uh, and the way they have formed this ministry is that they have uh, people who are paid to uh, take charge of these prayer sessions as in you know in the ministry full time ministry when so one is in full time ministry they are paid okay uh, and there are those who are volunteers as well who have committed time for certain slots and they come in and in that way they have kept this prayer going and uh, I, I would also say that you know it's it's not so easy for people to keep something like this going but i'm sure it's god's spirit working in them uh, that has helped them to keep uh, this day and night intercession worship going on now what are the results okay uh, of this form of worship so this form of worship has brought about uh, several testimonies and I will you know, quickly enlist, it is there in our notes, I'll just quickly enlist some of them for us so that you know, we are aware. So they talk about outreaches okay, that, uh, that have started from their ministry. Um, these outreaches, um, there is an inner city outreach where a mobile food truck is sent out and on-site food distribution takes place. There are discipleship programs which have which are born out of uh, you know this prayer movement. There's health clinic. There's provision for food, clothing for children. Uh, there are programs where uh, you know uh, children are helped, and there are programs where children are. Um, there's something called Big Sister and Big Brother program. I don't know all the details of that. Uh, then there is an Adopt a Block program. There has been crisis response uh, ministry that, that was started. Orphan Justice Center was started. There's something called Hannah's Dream, which is an adoption agency. Exodus Cry for the victims of human trafficking. So, you know, all these are out of the nature of God. And God is doing a powerful work in the community because there are people who are engaging. The list is the, the list goes on. You know, I didn't read all of it for us. But what am I trying to say? I'm just trying to say that when we obey what God wants us to do, there are results. We saw how the Moravians, they saw a powerful missionary zeal among them. We saw uh, the, uh, the saving of so many souls in um, Korea because of of this prayer movement that they engaged in. Now I hope shares all the things that God has done among them, you know, because they're engaging in this form of prayer and intercession. And also one of the amazing things about I hope is that they have something called like the night watch. You know, there's a passage uh, in the Bible which says, bless the, uh, Psalm 134 says, behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Okay, so who by night, stand in the house of the Lord. So they have gone by uh, you know, this passage and God's encouragement for 24 bar 7 intercession and prayer. And they have people who have committed to live their lives for the night watch. So there are people who have changed their entire daily schedule. Okay. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they, they, rest through the day as much as possible and then they go and do these night sessions so that is their ministry they've even made a change in their daily schedule so that there are night watch people who are continuing the worship so that it doesn't end in the night so you know that's the kind of commitment that uh, this ministry has uh, and uh, people have even signed up part-time full-time Workers have signed up, uh, young people, married people, you know, people in different stages of their life to keep the prayer going in the daytime as well as in the nighttime. So that's a, uh, like a, a little bit about how this 24 by 7 intercession and prayer 
uh, is scriptural and God is going to, uh, you know, make this happen even more in our times. And we are going to see more of this. And it's a good thing to see more of this because when we engage in this, we will see the results as well that God has promised. So I'm just going to pause here. If there's something more you want to add to it or, you know, anything that you want to ask, I think it will be uh, nice to do that. So the time is open for us. Please feel free to ask your questions or make your comments. But I'm hoping that it's quite clear. And uh, yeah, maybe you are aware of such ministries around you or you're, you yourself are part of it. Yeah, so anyone who's, who's already a part of something like this? Day and night prayer, day and night worship, or you've seen something like this. So, pass in Bangalore, uh, as you know, there's this uh, organization called Face to Face Foundation. Yes. yes. Um, so, they have uh, uh, extended hours of worship. Mm. Um, so I used to be part of uh, one of the sessions mm. um, to uh, sing with, along with the guys. Mm. Um, so we they usually give slots to each team. Mm. So we used to take uh, slots for uh, either one and a half hours or two hours uh, to worship the Lord together. And so at, in Bangalore, it happens for, um, it, this year it is happening for two days. Uh, so it's like 48 hours. But uh, I think last time and all, it went on to 100 hours uh, time of worship. Um, so people from different churches across the city and sometimes across the nation also, they would come together to worship the Lord together. Yeah. Wow, amazing, amazing, uh, John. And John, this has been happening for a, for many years now, no? Yes, Master. So it started in 2015. Um, mm -hmm. So it was like seven, eight years, I think now. Wow. Seven, six, seven years now. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, the continuous and orderly form of you know, prayer and worship as well as intercession. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing. Uh, would anyone else be aware of a similar, similar ministry in your city, in your country? Okay, maybe uh, if you're not aware, this is a good thing to to research and see if there are, you know, any any such uh, ministries out there. Okay, and yeah, Divya says I hope. Yeah, I hope in the U.S. That's that's right. Um, and you know, as much as I can observe, I think uh, though I don't know of too many ministries that are doing it day and night. I can see a lot of ministries and groups of, you know, um, uh, like worship teams engaging in extended hours of worship. Okay, so we're sort of headed there, is what I would say, um, and uh, it's it's incredible to see the passion, you know, to to worship the Lord for so many hours. People just gather together and worship, and you know, in recent times, uh, also all the songs that have come, the prophetic songs that have come by groups worshipping the Lord like this. Uh, you know, it's so beautiful. And I believe that, you know, uh, we, we are going to see it. And if you are somebody who's in a position of leadership uh, in, in your church, local community, you could encourage when people uh, have that 
zeal and passion you could encourage you could guide them in line with what you see here uh, about the tabernacle of david so let's close then if there are no questions i just want to uh, ask somebody to pray that you know god would do this in our midst god would revive us to this form of uh, you know uh, davidic order of worship and intercession so if someone can please lead in prayer that that will be good Okay. Uh, maybe I'll ask John. John, if you don't mind, could you please pray? Sure. Yes, yes, yes. Father, we want to thank you <clears throat> for the awesome time you have given us to learn from your word uh, regarding um, the importance of prayer and intercession, O oh God. Thank you for reminding us that you will pour out your spirit even as we um, uh, earnestly desire to rebuild the um, tabernacle of David among us, Lord Jesus. We pray and, O oh, oh God, we ask that we would experience Uh, you in a special way these days, O oh God, even as we uh, dedicate our time to worship and to pray and to seek your face, Master. Lord, we also pray that each one of us will have a heart uh, uh, to serve you uh, in worship, in, to serve you in, in, in the session, and to serve the people in prayer, O oh God. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we pray that you would uh, give us that spirit of understanding to understand the importance of this more and to walk in it uh, more authoritatively, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Nancy. Thank you for enabling her to teach the word. And we pray, O oh God, that uh, we would uh, bear fruit of what we have heard, Lord Jesus. We give you worship. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah. So take care. And I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, John uh, clarifies here face-to-face -face foundation started in Bangalore 2011. Okay. Okay, thanks, John. Thanks for that. Okay, all right. So, um, see you tomorrow, class. God bless you. Bye for now.